A century hasn't dulled the memory of the Great War to end all wars. There may be no more survivors of that tumultuous conflict, but the stories and commemorations continue to evoke the lessons of the fields of slaughter. Memorials pepper many a village and town of Britain and here on the fields of northern France, a reminder of the sacrifices made by so many young men in the Great War. And yet, there are millions of men whose stories have largely gone untold, forgotten in the mists of time. They too came to defend an imperial vision and hope for a better world. But their sacrifice commemorated on the battlefield has not necessarily become part of our national story. These are the stories of the four million soldiers who joined from British colonies across the globe from India to the West Indies, from the Gold Coast to Guyana. A number of these men joined home regiments like the Middlesex, nicknamed the Die Hards. Their reputation came from a battle in 1811 when a dying general called out, Die Hard 57th, Die Hard. This film explores the stories of four men from across the empire who joined the Middlesex to fight in France and beyond. The red on this map is Britain, a reflection of a cosmopolitan empire which sheds light on our modern diversity. Sam Manning from Trinidad, Ajit Anil Rudra from India, Kamal Chunchi from Ceylon and Harry O'Hara from Japan. Harry O'Hara was born in 1891 in Tokyo. He fled Imperial Japan in search of adventure after taking up the cause of the revolutionary forces in Russia. In the Great War, Japan was Britain's ally. When war broke out, he found himself in India. Why did he join up? His surviving family can't be absolutely sure. No, I don't know what, what prompted him. Perhaps an adventure or whatever. I wouldn't know. He, he dared a lot. He, he, uh, he wasn't afraid. He, um, perhaps because they said, well, they're going over to France. And he thought, well, I want to fight. That he, that he did that. Imperial duty for those educated in the Empire's Edwardian public schools led others to the Middlesex, like Kamal Chunchi. Born in 1896 in Kandy, he left his home in Ceylon and after a series of rejections for service, found his way to England and the regiment that rarely turned anyone away who was fighting fit. His main reason for coming was he felt it was his duty to fight for his king. Ajit Anil Rudra from India was born into a wealthy mixed Indian and Ceylonese family. He was raised in the capital of the British Raj, Delhi, and made his way to study at Cambridge. Arriving there in wartime, the university appeared dull, and he decided to chance his luck by enlisting in London. Rudra said of himself, I was refused enlistment on the grounds that I was an Indian. I was severely disappointed, but soon found a way around the difficulty. While preparing our voyage in Ceylon, I had been issued with a Ceylonese passport. So next day, ignoring the India office rules, I went back to the recruiting sergeant and convinced him that though an ethnic Indian, I was in fact a Sinhalese citizen. After a little argument, he accepted me. Samuel Manning was born on the Caribbean island of Trinidad in 1897. Many saw the First World War as an opportunity to escape the grinding poverty of island life than a gesture of imperial solidarity. Experts remind us that war brought a brief respite from colonialism for those who chose to fight. I mean, the earliest that we really know about him is his... Um, uh, uh, what's the word? I can't think of it volunteering to come to, to join the army in the First World War. 
Harry O'Hara's lighter complexion led him first to enlist with the Sikhs. But being short of stature, his commanding officer transferred him to the Gurkhas who were sent to France. From there, in 1915, he transferred to the Middlesex Regiment. He was ambitious and resourceful, earning the Military Medal for Bravery in 1917. But it was a love of adventure that took him to the newly founded Royal Flying Corps, first as a mechanic and then a pilot. He flew once as a dare, very, very low over the barracks, and he got reprimanded for that. That wasn't allowed. That, was, that wasn't good. <laughs> that sort of thing. He was, he was a bit of a... Yes, he was a bit of a daredevil. Started to talk, he decided to walk, pack to go away. Then everyone heard her say, Oh, Willie, 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 my sweet Willie, oh, please don't you go from me. The neighbor next door gonna laugh at me. Sam Manning joined the Middlesex Regiment at the outset of the war and was later transferred to the British West Indies Regiment. He went on to serve beyond the Western Front in France, in Egypt and Palestine. It's possible that his musical talents, like a number of black soldiers of the times, were seen as a useful way of taking the minds of soldiers off the grim realities of war. He immediately uh, plays that card. He ends, begins to entertain uh, troops in Jamaica. Ajit Rudra began in the Royal Fusiliers, where he fought in the Battle of the Somme, before being transferred to the Middlesex. It's quite possible that the loss of so many men in the first weeks of that battle created regimental orphans who were assigned to regiments that had enough survivors to continue the fight. My grandfather had fought at the Somme and uh, at a place, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, uh, it's in Belgium, Heaps. One of his medals, I think, said that uh, he was uh, uh, in the 15th or the 21st or something, Royal Fusiliers as Private A. A. Rudra, and that he'd fought in these uh, trenches. Like many men who fought in that conflict, the trauma of battle was a burden carried into life after the guns fell silent. They became a generation who were reluctant to talk, more inclined to leave their experiences on the killing fields of the Western Front with their comrades. Chunchi saw action in France and Salonika, and his grandson remembers it was not a subject his grandfather liked to talk about. But I just had the feeling that he, he never broached the subject. He didn't really want to talk about the service that he did in the war. And having seen all the documentaries of the First World War, I can, can understand why. Because I think for, for a lot of people, if they weren't completely damaged, a lot of them would have been very close to being damaged from what they suffered and saw. I think probably the worst aspect would have been his friends that he did his service with um, getting killed. Kamal Chunchi suffered injuries and gas attacks, recuperating in a Maltese hospital. Memories men perhaps left behind for good reason. Being gassed, um, as far as I know, he was gassed a couple of times and shot about the same and uh, patch him up and, and send him back. But he was got very badly wounded. He had uh, awful, uh, almost holes in his arm. They were right deep uh, in the scars and everything. During the Battle of the Somme, Ajit Rudra survived a direct hit by flying shrapnel, his rations tin saving his life. It was Trenchfoot that was to see him retired from the battlefield to recuperate in England. Then at some point, when he got this very bad 
situation with his feet. He just couldn't uh, stand on, on his own two feet. Uh, but he was actually evacuated and sent back to England. Having survived the trenches and the terror of combat, these men often buried their psychological wounds with the men they left behind. Back in Civvy Street, former comrades' pathways inevitably diverged. Sam Manning settled in New York City, and at the start of the Roaring Twenties, he created a popular vaudeville program in a Brooklyn theater. Manning kept moving, and his showbiz career brought him back to Britain, before eventually settling in the Gold Coast, modern-day Ghana, where he died in 1960. After the war was over in 1918, Rudra was commissioned into the Indian Army as an officer. He became a major general fighting in the Second World War in operations in Waziristan and Baluchistan before playing a significant role in the formation of the Indian Army after independence. I think he was just a, a character. He was uh, somebody who was an amazing person. Of course, I'm possibly being a little bit biased that he is my grandfather, but I do believe that he believed in huge values of human values of the milk of human kindness and all that kind of thing and you know his concept of morals and his uh, sense of duty were very very highly developed and um, he was just a wonderful person Kamal Chunchi emerged from the battlefields as a converted Christian. It led him into conflict with his Muslim imam father. He trained as a Methodist minister and founded the Coloured Men's Institute in Canning Town in 1926. A keen sportsman, he was a social activist who transformed the welfare of the emerging minority communities of the East End of London. I think one of his things would be that, you know, do unto others how you would want them to do to you. And I think that he'd probably be sad to think that a lot of people don't think like that. Harry O'Hara met his wife during the war after they'd become pen friends. She responded to his appearance in a national newspaper. His flying adventures continued after the war as a test pilot for the Royal Air Force. His injuries, though, prevented him from doing heavy work, and he became a painter for a charity raising funds for veterans. I don't think he felt that he was such an exception. He loved England, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't have stayed, and obviously he wouldn't have come. He must have got that love of England when he was in India or perhaps at school. I don't know. He never talked about it, but he did love England. O'Hara, Chunchi, Rudra and Manning. The names of a handful of men representing the millions of Empire soldiers who helped Britain secure victory in 1918. To forget the contributions of these soldiers of colour is to misunderstand who we've become in Britain today. A century later, these stories should be an essential reminder of the cosmopolitan roots of our modern, diverse country. <laughs>